My name is Grace, and I work for Cornwall Heritage Trust. Today I'm visiting Trefry Viaduct, a 19th century architectural wonder hidden in the Luxillian Valley near St Austell. The Luxillian Valley is owned by various public and private parties, and Cornwall Heritage Trust owns and cares for the viaduct, a small area of land around it, and part of the tramway. The first civil engineering structure of its kind to be built in Cornwall, the viaduct is now a scheduled monument and an integral part of the Cornish Mining World Heritage Site. I'm meeting John Smith, a local historian and archaeologist. His career included 23 years as field officer and senior archaeologist with Cornwall Archaeological Unit, during which time he directed a major landscape survey of the Luxillian Valley. I'm excited for him to show me round. Good morning. Morning, Grace. Thank you so much for meeting me here today. Very happy to have you here and to show you around our wonderful Luxillian Valley. Uh, we're going to look at the Trefry Viaduct today and have a look at all the activities that went on and in and around it. So perhaps we'll go and get started. Brilliant. We made our way from the car park, just a short walk up the hill to the higher tramway. There are lots of paths running through the valley, but this one is connected to the viaduct. Oh, wow, what a view. And now you can uh, see the whole thing from the top. And here we are, wow. our big bridge, <laughs> the Trefry Viaduct, built between 1839 and 1842. It is 100 feet high to the top of the parapets, 600 feet long, 200 metres in new money, uh, built of granite ashlar masonry, as you can see, which is as good today as the day it was built. And what's it doing here? Well, in order to understand why the viaduct is here, we really need to walk further down the valley, have a look down there and see what's going on at the very start of it all. Great, let's go. So who built the viaduct and why did they build it? A gentleman called Joseph Austin inherited a very extensive but poverty-stricken estate in Foy in the early 1800s. His mother was a Trefry, but he wasn't because his mother had married an Austin, so obviously she lost her maiden name. He set about improving the estate in his 20s and 30s, and one of the things he did was to invest heavily in a, a group of mines on Penpillock Hill, which became amalgamated as a mine called Foy Consoles. And he struck rich. They hit very, very rich reserves of copper. He needed a method of getting the copper to his port at Foy. And the roads at the time were really appalling. So his first thought was to construct a railway from the mine at Foy, Foy Consoles to the port of Foy. Mm. Uh, it would have been a horse-drawn tramway. But he couldn't get permission from the landowners, so he had to abandon that. Frustrated in his attempts to find a route for his copper, he looked the other way, he looked westwards, and looked at Parr. And Parr at that time was just an open beach, and there was a possibility, so he thought, of constructing a harbour there. Mm. So, to cut a very long story short, the harbour was constructed in 1829 through to 1831. Mm -hmm. It's basically the harbour you see today at Park, which is still functional. And it was a, a great success. But then, of course, he had to connect the copper mine to the harbour. Mm. And to do that, he constructed a canal from Ponce Mill all the way down the valley to his new harbour at Park. In the 1830s, his mine began to produce less and less returns, gradually but the, the writing was on the wall. So he looked then at the new industry of China clay production, thinking that he might tap into that. And he also wanted to tap into the reserves of granite that are here in the valley. To do that, he needed to extend his 
canal, but you couldn't extend a canal because the gradients are too steep. For a canal, you'd need millions of lots. So he then thought of constructing a tramway, a railway, from his canal terminus at Ponts Mill through the valley and on across into Luxillian Parish. So what we see here is the evidence for this connection. And so is he still Mr Austin at this point? No. Trefry changed his name in 1838. He couldn't just change his name by deed poll, so he had to actually ask the Queen for permission to change his name. And he got it done by royal assent. And he had to do that because he wanted to adopt the Trefry coats of arms. He's got interest now all over mid-Cornwall. Mm. One of the snags to all of this progress is that he doesn't own the Luxillian Valley. He doesn't own a lot of the land that he wants to put his canals and his uh, railways through. Mm -hmm. So he has to either purchase it or lease it or get permission from the landowners. We'll go and look at the stone. And what, what it is, it's a nice bit of archaeological evidence for what we've just been talking about. On this side, you can see it says T. T for Trefry. And on this side, K for Kendall. So that side, he's leasing it from Mr. Ken, Nicholas Candle. Yeah. You can see here that the actual construction is very good for a horse-drawn tramway. See how this big cutting, normally with horse-drawn tramways, the old builders would have just gone round it. Mm. But this is what you do with the steam railway. You, you, you cut through and yeah. you don't have a sharp curve. So it's quite a spectacular piece of work. Yeah, we'll go along here and we'll find a piece of the original tramway track, which is still in situ. Oh, wow. And that is a very, very rare thing indeed. Ooh. Trefry has got a model that he could have adopted of steam railways in Cornwall because in 1837 you've got the Hale Railway and the Hale Railway also has steam engines built by the Cobber House foundry so it's all homegrown product, you know. Trefry, born in 1782, so he's really an 18th century person and he surrounds himself with young talent. So he's got people like William West, the engineer, and you've got William Pease, who is his land agent. They were born around the turn of the century, so they're 20 years younger than Trefry. And Pease and he work out the costs for this. And they costed it two ways. They cost it for horse traction, and they cost it for steam traction. And horse traction comes out cheaper. And as we'll see in a moment, the decision to go with horses became a problem in later years. So this is gravelled in the middle when this is in use so that horses have got a, a smooth path mm. to tread. And the leet still following us here on our left-hand oh, side. Okay. This is the leet that's come across the viaduct mm. that we're following now. And the leet is now running under the tramway so they've had to make this nice little bridge yeah. with the granite lintels. So the tramway runs over the leet. They used granite for everything they could because mm. granite is cheap. <laughs> yeah, it's just sort of everywhere here. <laughs> All these fields that you see there would be covered in granite stones, granite boulders, yeah. really, really big. The whole of this valley was covered in it and they just called it Moorstone. So that's where all this has come from. It's not being quarried, it's Moorstone. Shall we go on? Yeah. Brilliant. Let's see how Mr. Trefry got the wagons up from Ponce Mill to the Incline Plain Head, which is where we are now. This is the Incline Plain Station, as it were. And you can see we're now at the top of the plain, and you can see the gradient that runs all the way down, 300 feet vertical height, one in seven-ish gradient. And the horses obviously can't come up the plain, so you've got horses down there, different horses up here, two sets of horses and they swap over. And this building here, we've always imagined perhaps it's the sort of checkers cabin at the top of the incline that keeps a tally on the wagons going up and down. 
we don't actually know what communication system they had from the top to the bottom. They must have had something, otherwise you wouldn't know when to start hauling. So that, that's a bit of a mystery. And now we'll go and take a look and see how they hauled the wagons up that inclined plane. It's bringing them up 300 feet, uh -huh. so it's fairly steep. And uh, if you're hauling quite a lot of wagons at a time, it's going to need a lot of power. Mm. And for that, the leap that we've been following is the power source. Uh -huh. So yeah. we've been following this all the way from the viaduct. It runs in this channel, out across this launder and out there. You can see that down there is a very large water wheel pit with the remains of a water wheel in the middle of it, just the hub. The wheel pit was built big enough to take a 50 foot wheel, but the wheel that's there now was a 40 foot. And that's not the original wheel either. That wheel was put in to drive the stone mill. There was a winding drum in this pit here, you can see just beside this small yeah. cutaway. And that winding drum had a rope on it and the rope went up there on that plinth. There was a sheave, it's called. It's just a big pulley wheel, basically. Yeah. So it, the rope went round that, it turned the corner and went down the inclined plane. I said earlier on that using horses and that the inclined plane presented a big problem for Trefry later on in that his tramway system couldn't be adapted in the way that others were for locomotive use. Locomotives can't go up and down the inclined plane. So a new railway was built through the valley, which is the railway that you came through on today, yeah. which is the present day Partanuki branch. And that was opened in 1874 as the Cornwall Minerals Railway, and that superseded this. So immediately all of this tramway system was redundant. Now we understood about the valley's industrial activity, we headed back up the tramway to find out more. What was here was a station. This is a depot here at this point where the two tramways join. So there's a tramway coming up through here, which we just followed up. Mm -hmm. There's a tramway going across the viaduct that way. And there's another tramway going off through the woods in that direction, which goes to the quarries at Colcaro and Carbians. Mm -hmm. So this is a junction station here. So you've got to imagine this is a very busy yard. And where there is a busy yard, there are people working and those people get hungry and cold and wet so they need somewhere to go and shelter and we have here a little hut which we call the crib hut and crib is a cornish word for your meal when you take your crib and you can see in there there's just a fireplace a little window and you can imagine a couple of wooden benches on either side and perhaps this is a suitable time for us to take a bit of refreshment. Oh, oh lovely, thank you. <laughs> Very authentic. Very authentic, it's a pity we can't light a fire, isn't it? That'd be, be nice. Oh, so it's better for a bite to eat. <laughs> This is where Trefry in 1839 had a problem in the sense that he'd come all the way up from his canal terminus at Ponce Mill. Now he had to cross the valley and this is the solution to that problem. It's a, it's a pretty grandiose solution, <laughs> especially when you consider that in Cornwall at that time, there was no comparable structure. It never carried locomotives. It was always for horses. So this is probably the best surviving monument to the horse-drawn railway in the British Isles. Oh, wow. So it's got a particular significance because of that. By the time the viaduct is finished, he is 62 years old. So this is the, if you like, a last throw of the dice, because now he wants to complete the line right through. What we've got here is a very ambitious scheme. What we're looking at is not just a viaduct, but it is special, not just because of that, but for other reasons too. First reason is the way it's built. The stones are perfectly squared and dressed so that each one fits perfectly to its neighbour, and this is called ashlar masonry. 
and the whole viaduct is constructed of it, not just the parapets or the fancy bits. But when you get down below and look, you'll see that all of it is ashlar. So that is a very expensive and very posh way of building. The second reason is, it's not just for a tramway, the viaduct is also an aqueduct because the leap that we've been following all the way back up here ran across the viaduct at a lower level. It's down there. There's a channel goes all the way through the viaduct below, a bit like the Roman aqueducts, which Trefry would probably have seen on his grand tour, which was part of his education. All this area that you're looking at below us now, when the viaduct was built and completed in 1842, was not woodland then, this was clear. Walking down the hill, we approached the viaduct from underneath to get a better sense of its scale. Wow, it's huge! Yes, now we're down at this level, we can see the true scale of the viaduct. But this one's particularly impressive because it's stylish to a degree which is unnecessary for its function. You don't need to have something that looks as posh as this to have a railway bridge. <laughs> but this is very nice. It's in a style which we would now call classical, with perhaps something of an Egyptian influence, which Egyptian things were very popular in Cornwall in the 1840s. And there's a hint of that with these piers, the way that they splay out at the base, and of course the fact that it is ashlar masonry. So every stone is cut perfectly to fit every other individual stone. Why do you think he built it so elaborately? It establishes the Trefry brand. It's making a big statement, isn't it? Now you could have built it a lot more cheaply, but they probably didn't have any experience of doing that. Whereas Trefry has got experience of doing just that at place. And he can translate that to this engineering project here. The thing we must remember with the viaduct is that it's a dual function structure. It's a aqueduct as well as a viaduct. The surveying necessary to arrive at a point that side of the valley, which is precisely aligned with the Charlestown Leap, which is where it's picking up the water. Charlestown Leap was already there in 1790s, being built to serve Charlestown Harbour. Mm. And that is Mr. Trefry's target, if you like. He's got to capture that water, divide it up, agreed with Mr. Rashley, and Trefry has his share, and that drives the inclined plane. Mm. That's a feat of surveying, which is in the 1840s, something which is uh, difficult to comprehend, really, that they could do it that accurately, but they did. And the viaduct actually is built so that the most gentle of slopes mm. delivers that water to the head of the inclined plane and drives the water wheel there. That's quite a feat of engineering. It is. <laughs> it's not something I would want to do. <laughs> and from here, we get this wonderful view with the supporting piers marching across the valley. Although Trefry's vision when it started out was no more really than facilitating the export of copper ore from his mine at Foy Consoles. After about 1820 or so, copper ore is no longer being smelted in Cornwall. It's all having to go to South Wales for smelting. Mm. That's simply because it's actually cheaper to take the copper ore to the coal rather than bring the coal to the copper. But as time went on, he must have thought in terms of this transpeninsular route which would cut across Cornwall and would cut out the hazardous journey round Land's End. And of course the hazard of that was not just Land's End itself, but the whole of the north coast of Cornwall. So he purchased Newquay Harbour, a little fishing village of Newquay as it was then, and the idea was to connect his new harbour at Parr with Newquay, which now exists, of course, <laughs> with a railway line. But he never saw that come to fruition because Defry sadly died in 1850, when he was only 68. The person who inherited his estate, the Reverend Trefry, actually did complete the link. 
that line was the Cornwall Minerals Railway, and it was steam drawn. And that later became taken over by the Great Western Railway and became the present day Newquay to Parr branch, which in its higher reaches beyond Luxillian Village is actually built on the line of the horse-drawn tramway. And so today, when you go to Newquay by train, you're actually still traveling on Mr. Trefry's tramway route. <laughs> And he would have been very pleased to know that his legacy continues to be useful in the modern day. Trefry Viaduct is open to the general public and one of a number of sites cared for by Cornwall Heritage Trust. To plan your visit, head to our website to find out more. <laughs>